I believe that's the best team there is. And somebody needs to do something to sabotage Ann to keep her from going back <laughs> home. I've entitled this message, The Kingdom That Will Stand. The Kingdom That Will Stand. Now, in the next three chapters, we're going to read quite a bit about a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, the king that God raised up. And there are three fascinating stories with regard to him in the next three chapters. And Nebuchadnezzar does not realize it yet, he will, that he's nothing more than a pawn in God's hand doing God's will. Beginning in verse 1, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. How many times has that happened to you? You dream and you can't get back to sleep and you're thinking about the contents of that dream. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they come, they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I've dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. I didn't understand it, but I knew I was troubled. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king, in Syriac, their language, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we'll show thee the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. I don't remember it. All I remember is feeling troubled, but I don't remember what the actual dream was. If you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your house shall be made a dunghill. That's pretty severe. And these fellows knew he'd do that. He'd done it before. And they were no doubt troubled. How in the world am I going to interpret a dream when you can't even tell me what the dream is? Verse 6, but if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. I need to know both the dream and what it means. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll show the, the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me, but if you'll not make known unto me the dream, there's but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Now, I love what he says to these guys. He says, you're just trying to buy us yourself time. And you're preparing lying and corrupt words. You know, I thought, what a description of most of what goes under the name of preaching. Corrupt words, lying words that are not so, that not, are not according to the scriptures. And he knew this and he knew what these fellows were doing. He was a shrewd man. And he says, I know what you're about. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there's not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there's no king, lord, nor ruler that's asked such a thing of any magician or astrologer or called in. It's a rare thing that the king requires, and there's none other that can show it before the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. What you're asking us to do is impossible. 
The only one who can answer this is that one who is not flesh. He said the gods. He obviously didn't know who the living God was, but he knew this, or these men knew this. What you're asking of us is impossible. It cannot be done. Verse 12, for this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise man should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Now you'll remember from the last chapter, last week, that Daniel and his fellows were ten times better than the Babylonians and the Chaldeans. And look how the Lord had equipped Daniel. Look back in chapter 1. And as these four children, verse 17... And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God had given him the grace to see what they were and to interpret the meaning. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. Now, he was so mad that he wanted to get rid of all wise men. I don't know if he even thought about Daniel because he had had such respect for Daniel and these three men, but he was angry. And he says, we're just going to get rid of all the wise men. All you guys got is corrupt and lying words. You can't be trusted. Verse 14. Then answered Daniel with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He had already had this Command, kill every one of them. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. He told them about how the king had a dream, couldn't remember what it was, demanded that the wise men tell him what it was and tell him what the interpretation is, and they couldn't do it. And so he said, you're all going to be killed. He gave this information to Daniel. Verse 16, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. And Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and his companions that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. They couldn't figure it out. They were completely dependent upon the Lord to make it known. And they understood that. So they desire mercies. Lord, please show us what the dream is and what the interpretation is. And you know, we're just as dependent upon the Lord as they are. You think this is a, a supernatural thing. Well, me and you understanding the gospel is a supernatural thing. The only way we're going to understand it is if the Lord is pleased to make it known. Just like with these fellows. Verse 19, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Now the only way Daniel could ever know what this dream was is that the secret would be revealed. And I'm looking at some people right now who've experienced the same thing Daniel did. God revealed to you the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that glorious? God revealed to you his gospel. I love what Paul said when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. What a revelation. 
The Lord said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hid these things. You did this. You hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. No man knows the Son save the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever he will reveal him. Do I have any idea of how blessed I am that he has revealed himself and his gospel to me? He's hid it from others, and he's revealed it to me. Well, Daniel's response, verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that have understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made me known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Now, I hear the term quite often. A Christian worldview. You ever heard that? A Christian worldview. <laughs> I know it is. The world is. That's all you need to know. That's the Christian worldview. It all belongs to him, and he's controlling everything and everybody, and he's rules. <laughs> That's the Christian worldview. The Lord rules the world, and he controls everything. Verse 22 speaks of his omniscience. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. And not only does he know all things, he knows the king's matter, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, but he also knows the king of kings' matter, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is for his glory. Everything is for his glory. Do you know that? Do you understand that? That this book is about his glory. And you really believe that. You really believe that this book is about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that God has revealed that to you. He's made himself known to you. Now let's look where Daniel's brought in before the king. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I'll show unto you. This was Daniel speaking. Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I'll show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste. And said thus unto him, I found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. Remember, he changed it to a Chaldean name. It was Daniel, and he gave him a new name. And it was named after <coughs> one of their false gods, like he did the other three. He named them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I've seen and the interpretation thereof? You know, when I've read that, uh, are you able to tell somebody the secret of God? The secret of the gospel? The secret of how God saves sinners by Christ? Can you make that known? Can I make that known? Are you able to make known unto me the dream which I've seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and he couldn't, he couldn't let this dig go. The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, and the magicians, and the soothsayers show unto the king? What about those fellas? Can they tell you? He knew the answer to that, but he couldn't help but getting in that dig 
against these guys. Verse 28, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. I'm not the one that can figure this out, but God can make this known. There's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now notice what he says. He's going to let you know what shall be. Not what might be if. What shall be. Not what will be if you. What shall be. I love that. He's letting you know what shall be because he's God. Well, how does God know what shall be? Because God determined what shall be. Because God purposed what shall be. And known unto God are all his works from the beginning. He's going to let you know what shall be. You, you know, you and I could get some comfort from this. If the Lord gives us grace to believe it. You know that everything that takes place is God's purpose being done. You know, I was uh, listening to a guy preach, and he was, uh, he was saying something. But if you say that, you're saying God's the author of evil. You know, that's, that's just stupid. Uh, God reigns. God's in control. And you want to, well, if you say he controls everything, you're saying he's the cause of evil and the author of evil. Well, I know who, he said, I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace, I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Are you saying God does evil things? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there's only one reason for evil, God. He's the only reason. Didn't take him by surprise. It was all a part of his purpose to manifest himself, to manifest the glory of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. God reigns. He's in control. And he's letting Nebuchadnezzar know what shall be. Not what might be if this contingency takes place and this condition is fulfilled, but what shall be. Quit looking at secondary causes. God is the cause of causes. He maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. He purposed it, it shall come to pass. This is certain. There's not anything you can do to stop this. There's not anything you can do to bring it on. This is what's going to happen because God has purposed it. Verse 30, But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Now, Daniel does what all true prophets of God do. I'm not any better than anybody else. This isn't happening because of me. There's nothing special about me that's causing this to take place. God's doing it because he's willing to do it. Verse 31. Now he gives him the dream. Verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was a fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest, now here's the image. Did it look like a man? I guess it did. A man with a gold head, silver arms, silver belly, a, a bronze midsection, iron legs, and the toes made out of iron and clay. Now, here's where all this means. Verse 35. Verse 34. 
Thou sawest, this is still part of the vision. He has not given him the interpretation yet. He's just giving him the vision. This is what you dreamed. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. There was nothing human that touched this. It was cut out without hands. Which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. This rock, this stone cut out without hands. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. Things that we consider so durable. This stone crushed them and destroyed them. And they became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away. And no place was found for them. They were gone. And the stone that smote them, smote the image, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now in this vision... This stone becomes all that there is. There isn't anything else but this stone. Verse 36, this is the dream. Now we're going to give you the interpretation. We're going to tell you what all this means. Thou, O king, verse 37, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, that he hath given unto thine hand, and he hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now he's talking about the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, the most mighty man in the world, whose will was done. He says, there's one reason you're like this. God made you this way. That's the only reason. You are this head of gold. Verse 39, And after thee, you're not going to stay. This kingdom's not going to last. After thee shall arise, and they're going to defeat Nebuchadnezzar. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. That's the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. We read about that with Cyrus as the king and Darius as the king. And Daniel was through their reign too. But they defeated Nebuchadnezzar and took over. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now this is talking about Alexander the Great. He bore rule over all the earth. And you can see God's wonderful providence in this because through Alexander the Great, what is the main language of the earth? Greek. Greek. This is how the gospel was going to be communicated, through this language, the Greek language. And God set this up so this would take place, so everybody would be reading Greek, speaking Greek, and this exact language that's more exact than any other language is what God used to communicate the New Testament. And what about this fourth kingdom? Verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, this is talking about Rome. Rome. The Roman Empire. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdues all things, and as the iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And Rome took over the world. And once again, you can see God's wonderful providence in this. Because through the infrastructure of Rome, the, the roads, the, the ways to the city, every road leads to Rome, a way for the gospel to be spread was there that wouldn't have been there until this kingdom took place. So God used all these kingdoms for the bringing about of his purposes. But none of them are going to last. And this one won't either. All the kingdoms men have, have uh, been a part of, and this one's risen, and that one's risen, they all end up falling. And if the Lord didn't come back, this one will end up falling. Verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes and part of the potter's clay and part of the iron, the kingdom shall be divided. It fell apart. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of the iron and part of the clay, so this kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. 
And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, this fifth kingdom, you know what kingdom this is. This is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of heaven. It will be forever. It will stand forever. The kingdom of God. Now, this kingdom that he's speaking of now, I love thinking about this. It's not a worldly kingdom. The Lord said, and I hope we'll all listen to this, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, and you wouldn't be able to stop them that I should be not delivered hence. But now my kingdom is not of this world. This is not some kind of political kingdom. It's not of this world. It has nothing to do with this world. You know, don't get too taken up with any of the kingdoms of this world. They're all going to fall, and there's only one kingdom that's going to last. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, it's a kingdom is the jurisdiction over which the king reigns. What's a kingdom without a king? Well, it's not a kingdom, is it? A kingdom has a king. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the king of this kingdom. He's the Lord of lords. And he's the king of kings. And all other kingdoms are in his hand. I love that scripture, Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart. I don't care what king you're talking about. In, uh, anywhere in the world. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The father said to him, Thy throne, a king has a throne. Thy throne, O God, is forever. It's an eternal throne. It's a throne of glory. It's a throne of justice. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. And thank God it's a throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Thy throne, O God, is forever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, his kingdom is omnipotent. No other kingdoms can stand before him. Look in verse 44 once again. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. There's nothing that can stand against this kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the way... He uh, talks about um, how the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hell will try to keep her constituents, but anyone the Lord is pleased to bring out of there, he's going to bust the doors down and bring his people out. You see, he's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. And this kingdom is a kingdom of grace. Turn with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 20. If somebody asks me what my favorite parable is, I think this is what might come up to my mind first. Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like. Now that ought to catch our attention. What's the kingdom of heaven of like? Well, here he's going to tell us. The kingdom of heaven is like. 
unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, everybody got the same thing. Everybody got the same thing. Everybody got what was right. He sent them into his vineyard. Now remember, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is not a worldly kingdom. The world doesn't operate on this principle. Only the kingdom of heaven operates on this principle. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go, ye also into the vineyard. And whatsoever is right, I'll give you. Now you just, you just write that down. That's what he's always going to do. Whatsoever is right, that is exactly what I'll give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, 5 p.m. He went out and found others standing idle <coughs> and saith to them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, you shall receive. I, I just love that. Do you know if the Lord brings you into heaven, it's right? It's right. If the Lord sends you to hell, it's right. Whatever he does is right, and that's the emphasis in this. Whatsoever is right, whatsoever is right, that's what you're going to receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Just like he said at the beginning of the day, you get into this labor, you get a penny. Not more, not less. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. Now, wouldn't you suppose the same thing? I work 12 hours. They work one hour. I bore the burden and the heat of the day. It wasn't even hot when they were working. Of course, I'll get more. I've done more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they'd received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. It's not fair, saying, Thou hast, thou, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. And I'll give unto this last, even as unto thee, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Can you say amen to that? He goes on to say, is thine eye evil because I'm good? So the last shall be first, and the first last for many are called but few are chosen. Now that's the kingdom of sovereign grace. And this kingdom is the kingdom that requires the new birth to see it or enter it. You're going to have to be born of the Spirit of God for you to even know what I'm talking about. It'll make no sense unto you if you're not. And you've got to be born of the Spirit to enter this kingdom, both to see it and to enter it. And I love the descriptions the Bible gives of the subject of this kingdom. The subject, that's me and you. Matthew 5, 3, what's the first beatitude? Blessed are the who? The poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the last beatitude says, Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you and I both know that that's not talking about you're persecuted because of the good works you do. That's talking about maintaining the righteousness of Jesus Christ as the only righteousness there is. I love Paul's definition of the kingdom of heaven in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Remember that? Drop that in my mind. Turn to Romans chapter 14, verse 17. I know it, but as soon as I said remember that, I forgot what it is. Romans 14, 17.
Verse 17. For the kingdom of God, that's what we're talking about. The kingdom that shall stand forever. The kingdom that will destroy all other kingdoms. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not there's something you can do to make it better, and there's something you cannot do to make it worse. It's not meat and drink. It's not do's and don'ts. It's not man's religion. But what is it? I love the simplicity of this answer. It's not meat and drink. It's righteousness. The righteousness of God. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. The believer's personal righteousness before God. Seek ye the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And what comes as a result of that? Peace. If the righteousness of Jesus Christ is my righteousness before God, that's my personal righteousness. I've got peace with God. He doesn't have anything to be mad at me about. I'm perfect. I'm perfectly righteous. And I've got peace with His providence. He's controlling everything. No reason to worry. He rules. He reigns. He's in control. And what comes from the, that? Joy. Righteousness. His righteousness. Peace that comes from His righteousness. Anything else, I don't have any peace from. But oh, if His righteousness is the only righteousness, what peace we have. And what comes out of that peace? Joy. Joy. The joy and peace of believing. Now look what, back to our text in Daniel chapter 2. We'll close her up. Verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Who's that stone? You know, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he became a mountain so large that he's always there. Isn't that Christ is all? Christ is all. And he destroyed all these other kingdoms. The stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Now he shouldn't have done that. You know that, and I know that. This is his first experience. He's going to get to where he knows better than this. By the time we get to chapter 4, he wouldn't have done anything like this. But this is the first thing he does. He was impressed with Daniel. And commanded they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods. And a Lord of kings. And a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret, then the king made Daniel a great man, and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. He became the Babylonian's boss. You know, that didn't sit real well with them. Uh, they try over and over again to do something about this, but here they bring in this Hebrew, and he somehow is able to interpret these dreams, and now he's over us. How the wise men of Babylon hated Daniel and these three young men. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat at the gate of the king. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for that kingdom, the kingdom of thy Son, 
that will stand forever. How we thank you for the stone made, taken out of the rock without hands, thy son. And how we thank you for his reign. And how we thank you for his salvation. How we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. How we thank you for his righteousness as our righteousness before you. How we thank you for your good providence that you control everything. Lord, how we thank you for the revelation of thy gospel that you revealed that which we would never have known had you not revealed it. And Lord, take this message and bless it for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Matt, come